morning. Welcome to SNEC. I uh, still have this in my hand because uh, some of you have yet to put in your name. It is not on. Is it on now? Yes, it's on now. So, uh, yes, uh, just the name for of you, John Tan. You know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fred, I'm doing it. So, uh, uh, please fill it in. I'll leave it here on the piano. So, some of you say you can't find it, it's right here. And uh, some of us are away today, and yet the church is filled, praise God. And, uh, let us continue on our journey in understanding why we are here and what we are doing here. But before that, let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father God, we thank you for life, we thank you for the day, we thank you for your love and your purpose and desire to communicate with us because of your love. And this morning, may we experience your love and understand you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're in a series called Insider Trading, where we are told about this book, where there's information that will give us privilege, uh, information about life. You know, we talk about how insider trading is illegal, for those who are trading in shares and stocks and all that, because they have privileged information. They know things they're not supposed to, and because of that information, they make decisions based upon that, and they reap benefits. Last week we talked about the fact that the Bible is an insider trading manual for us for life. That God gave us the Word of God for a purpose. And that purpose is to communicate his desire to have a relationship with us. The motivational factor in him giving us the Bible is not to control, to bound, to burden. His motivation for giving us the word is to tell us how much he loves us. But then we need to look at today's topic, the reliability of the word. This is the Cherry QQ version 3, made in China. It's known for its cheap cost. It's known to be lightweight and fuel efficient. It is known to be mobile and easy to pack. But it's not known for its power. One time, me and my friends we're in this car. It's driven by a lady driver and there's other three boys who are pretty big. We went up a slope that is not unlike the slope you have to come up from the basement of SDEX car park to our front gate. Halfway up, our friend says, can you all get down please? <laughs> I don't know what happened. We can't go up. So we got down from the car. We didn't really have to push, but we just thought we'd do it. And we tried to push and the car went out. It's not known for power, it's not known for strength, and definitely not known for reliability. Anything and everything that can break down in this car of my friend has broken down before. So pretty much she had had a new car. Because every part has been swapped out except for the shell. And uh, some of them have been swapped out twice. So with power window, it has a power window. How we know she, she managed to wind it down on a rainy day and she put it around quite a bit out. And uh, got it fixed. And then the next week, we wind it out and we couldn't wind it up again. And then, so she decided to never ever open the window ever again. But then she had to, you know, cash card. Some places still do not use the scanning thing. You still have to insert your cash card. My friend would open the door just to be safe. This, on the other hand, is Toyota Highlands. I'm not selling cars to the church. <laughs> a favorite uh, TV show called Top Gear. Top Gear is uh, where these three crazy British guys uh, will go around testing cars and uh, they do crazy things with cars. Uh, I don't watch it anymore because three of them left. It's not funny anymore. Uh, I appreciate British humor and they're very good at it. And one of the things they did was they set out to destroy Toyota Hilux. As part of the, the series, uh, every season, once in a while, they say, how can we destroy this car? Because it's been known as the most reliable car. So they've drowned it, you know, chucked into the water, and then they turned the key, and it came on, it worked. 
So they, 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 they lifted it up to about five story high and just dropped it. Bam! Put a key in, turn, came up. Uh, they tried smashing it, in, uh, using it to smash into houses, kill those houses. It worked. And they tried doing every single crazy, stupid thing you would do to a car, and the car lives on. And it's not even this new version, it was the 1980 version. And so, in, in, in memory of that, they actually hanged the car in the studio. It's there forever because it's a car that cannot be destroyed. So I had a Toyota Rush, and that car was good. And I didn't rely on it. It may not be the best, fastest, or um, the, the most comfortable, but it will go on and 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 on. Reliability. So we talk about reliability, we ask the question. When we ask the question, is it reliable? We are actually asking the question, is it quality? Is it good quality? And so when we're discussing about the Bible, we're asking ourselves, is the Bible reliable? We're asking ourselves, is the Bible made up of good quality? Where did the information of the Bible come from? Is that the question we're asking? Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter is at the back of your Bible, towards the right, right beside the book of James. I always say that, although nobody knows where the book of James is. Right after Hebrews, book of James, right after James in 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. See, as Christians, we come to church and we have a manual that we base our beliefs on. We don't base our beliefs on what the pastors say. That doesn't, that doesn't make us Christian, it makes us something else. If you come here and we believe what we believe because the pastor preached according to the Bible and we understand the Bible and we live according to the Bible and in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter the disciple, verse 15, it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Are you able to explain to people why you are a Christian? Are you able to explain to people when they ask you, why do you base your faith upon the scripture? Are you? Peter says, as Christians, we should be able to, and in fact, we're expected to be able to explain why. Let us look at the New Testament, at the quality of the manuscripts that gives us our Bible today. You will see that it used to be spelled gospel. That's old English. I'm glad we don't have to spell it like that anymore. The New Testament, how many books are there in the New Testament of the Bible? 27, that's correct. There's 27 books in the New Testament of the Bible. And these 27, we call it books, but it's very confusing to somebody who do not understand the Bible, because isn't that this a book? And why do we have books within a book? Because it is actually a, a compilation, or we call it an encyclopedia of that many books written by different authors inspired by the same. Hey, what does that even mean? But in the book of John, John was inspired by God to write that book. And this is a collection of God's inspiration upon various authors to give us this, we call it the index collection. It used to be scrolls, right? This is called the index. It's indexes of a book. And so people ask me, James, where did people know that that was the correct uh, manuscript that, that, that John wrote? Did they have the original uh, piece of the paper that, that John wrote on and will pass to the other churches. How about the other books, the letters? We know that a lot of these are not books, but in fact letters written by Paul to different places. To the Church of Corinth, to the Church of Galatia, to the Church of Ephesus, to the Church of Thessalonia. These are all letters. So do you have the actual letter? How do you know it's not a person collecting different fragments and saying that this is what Paul wrote? Good question. And the 
it's a very fair question. See, this is one of the, the, the Old Testament fragments that you can find or uh, at a time. And then, and then in fact, uh, this is the original. This one R and two V. They mark it or they found. So the, the New Testament that we have today is a compilation of many, 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 many manuscripts like this and scrapes and pieces that people find in various pieces and they put it together and they compare the text in it and also they date the fragments and the manuscript to see how far back does it go. And so how many fragments and manuscripts do you think we have? For just the New Testament alone, we have more than 10,000 manuscripts, not including fragments. Fragments means it's not a full piece of a paper anymore, just a piece of it left. Over 7,000 fragments all combined. We have more than 20 to 30,000 pieces of original parchment paper written of the original New Testament. Iliad of Homer is accepted by the academic world as fact. In fact, they, they believe that, that Homer wrote it. Although they may not believe all the stories in it, but they believe that this book circulated around the time that Homer lived. Do you know there's only 700 manuscripts and fragments of this book? Only 700. And yet, the academic world do not question the authenticity and historical accuracy of this book. The Bible, the New Testament, has more than 20,000 manuscripts and fragments. And yet, people still question whether the Bible is accurate. 700 is a lot for a historical collection. We have 20,000. And in fact, within the first hundred years after the passing of Jesus Christ, the entire New Testament had been quoted by other authors, be it religious or non-religious. Every verse in the New Testament has been quoted. You know, when you write a, a paper, an essay, you have to quote uh, from people and you put references. Every single verse of the New Testament within the first hundred years of the passing of Jesus Christ, we have proof of those documents except for 11 verses. The entire New Testament has been quoted, counter quoted, some by the enemies of Christianity saying they say this in their book. Not by our own people, by the enemies of the Bible quoting what we wrote. Within the, so we know for a fact that within 100 years of the passing of Jesus Christ, the New Testament already existed. Except for the 11 verses. I, mean, I, come on. I don't even know what the 11 verses are. So how about the Old Testament? So we know for a fact, according to archaeological science and sociology study, that is very reliable. Good quality manuscripts, good quality witnesses, good quality references shows us that we should believe in the New Testament. But how about the older part of the Bible? The Old Testament, which is further back in history, which is more removed that we call, don't have access maybe to the, the manuscripts at that time. What do we do about the Old Testament? First of all, Jesus Christ himself, because now we know that the New Testament is trustworthy and reliable, he quotes from the Old Testament. And in fact, a lot of the New Testaments are direct quotation of the Old Testament. So for New Testament people, new community living at that time, they believe in the Old Testament. They believe in its existence and its accuracy and, and how it was already established. Jesus himself established, affirms seven key points about the Old Testament. In fact, for me, it's easier to believe the Old Testament because Jesus himself quotes from it and believes in it. So I have no problem believing in the Bible that Jesus believed in. I, so I don't understand why people say can throw away the Old Testament when Jesus Christ himself believes and quotes from it. I don't understand. You say you're better than Jesus Christ. I don't know. 
The seven points. Jesus affirmed, I'm going to know guys, so he's a, a, a PhD, double PhD uh, professor who started two theological seminary and an author and, and a sociologist. He wrote, he writes this about what Jesus affirms. Jesus affirmed its divine authority, saying that it's inspired by God, Old Testament, its imperishability, nothing can be destroyed, nothing can be taken away, remember what he wrote, not a dot or a tittle or iota can be removed. He's talking about the Old Testament. New Testament hasn't been written yet, it is still alive. It says its unbreakability is full watertight arguments in there. Next, it says his ultimate supremacy that people himself during his time on earth submitted himself to the teaching of the scripture. It's factual inerrancy. You missed this morning's video that Uncle Fred Long showed us. He just showed us 10 scientific facts shown from the Bible. See, people can make guesses. You know, guesses about the future and they may get one in ten correct. But to that, so many of it correct? Come on. It's historical reliability and it's scientific accuracy. Jesus himself, see Jesus as a person is proven. His existence is no longer argued. He exists, whether you're religious or not, people have accepted that he exists. And he as a person, who lived during the time of Jesus, Jesus living during the time of Jesus, who says and affirms these seven points. Turn me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. He, Jesus Christ, claiming about himself, says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Note, this is a technical term for the Jews to refer to the Old Testament. The law and the prophets equals the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill whatever has been said in the Old Testament. I didn't come to destroy the Old Testament, I came to fulfill it. For truly I say to you, this is the word, this is the verse, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law, which is the Old Testament verse 5 book, not the Ten Commandments, until all is accomplished. See, Jesus is brave. He doesn't, he doesn't just restrict it to Exodus chapter 20. He says, nothing in the first five book the Pentateuch will be taken away. Not a part of the law until it's accomplished. It's including all five of the first five books of Old Testament. Everything in it is said will be accomplished and nothing will be changed. Including the Ten Commandments, the Exodus. Well, let's look at what archaeology has shown us. This is the actual photograph of when it was first found of some of the manuscripts of the day see scroll. Not heard about it, find out more about it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. It was found in 1947 to 1956 that they found jars, earthen vessels collecting scrolls uh, dating 300 years before Christ. So these shepherd boys would go around the place and they would herd their sheep and uh, one of them ran away, ran away and uh, couldn't find him, he was going around uh, thinking that his, 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 his sheep would be hiding in one of the caves. He took a rock and was throwing to the cage, trying to find, trying to scare the sheep out of the caves. And as he threw the rock in one of the caves, he heard a cracking sound, breaking of an earthen vessel. And he said, what is that? Thinking that it was jewels or something precious of gold, he went in there to, to take whatever he could find. Only really disappointedly found scrolls of leather and <coughs> brass or copper uh, of, of words. I didn't really read a lot, but I just found all this thing there. I took one and went to the market and sold it for like 20 pence, which is like five dollars. Not knowing it's worth. At that time, as archaeologists around the area, the in various part of um, where, uh, where this Qumran is, it's about three, two, uh, two, one, 20 quick kilometer away from Jerusalem. And this archaeologist got his hands on the scroll and he says, this is 
historical artifact. And he went back and found the boy and bring me to the cave. And they went and they spent nine years going through all the caves and they found in various caves in Qumran, earthen vessels that stored scrolls dating 300 years before Christ of the Old Testament. Every single book was found except for Esther. That's another story. But they found every single book in the Old Testament hidden in these jars dated 300 years before Jesus Christ. Nobody had ever in any other modern collection of historical literature, nobody had a such a complete collection within such a time frame. Nobody. Except for the Bible. So throughout the year, they found more and more manuscript, dating 300, 200, 100, collection after collection. And they found a complete manuscript. You can see, actually, these Dead Sea Scrolls go on tour around the world of Isaiah 53. And you look at the, the collection, the Isaiah 53 in there in Hebrew, the difference between that and what we have in our hands and what we can buy in the shop less than 0.01%. Maybe just a little dot here. Very little difference between a manuscript that was 300 BC and what we can have in our hands today. If you try copying something, over and over and over again, I had to do that a lot when I was younger because uh, I would uh, not do my homework and, uh, or not learn my Chinese spelling test and the teacher have a very good way of making us remember. If you don't remember the word, but you didn't bother to memorize, I just said write it out 1,000 times. So I will write because I have to write or else I go to class. So I found a very good way of writing. So I'll tie five pens together. <laughs> write it together. Five rules at a time, man. Still a lot. One thousand times, still a lot. But I realized that my handwriting would deteriorate, there'd be wrong strokes, uh, uh, maybe mistakes along the way. And uh, imagine somebody had to take my copy off the original and copy it, and then and copy it, and copy it, and for, for 10 years. I don't think we're writing the same words. It's been 2,000. 320 years, roughly, because the priests make a serious miscalculation. 2,320 years in the collection, and the manuscript from then is 0.01% different from what we have today. Reliability, quality, accuracy. But now since we're in Singapore and I'm very good at this subject from mathematics, let's do some mathematics. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament made about Jesus Christ. Any of them? So this author took eight of them and decided to calculate the probability of all of it fulfilling in one person. For those of you who have forgotten your mathematics, Probability is calculated so. Let's say the probability of uh, a person being bald is one in the amount of bald people. You say, everyone would say how many bald guys are there, you must know the number of bald guys. The guys in the world first. So about 50% with about 8 billion guys in the world, so about 4 billion. And then you can calculate from there different probability, like one in 4 billion chance. One in M, M is the the amount of people. And then you're going to multiply by the second factor you wanted to include. For example, I want a guy who's bald. You're going to find all the bald guys who are male. And then you say, you've got under 40 years old, times 40 years old. So one times M times N. I lost half of you for this mathematics. So this guy called Peter W. Stoner take eight of Jesus' prophecy about Jesus from the Old Testament and he did this. He's, his article was presented, he writes a, a journal called Science Speaks, 
and presented to, uh, this was H. Harold Hartzler, uh, wrote the, the uh, uh, analysis and critic of his article. And say the manuscript Science Fix has been carefully reviewed, not by him alone, by a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation members and executive, executive council, and has been found in general to be dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. The mathematical analysis included is based on principles of probability, which are thoroughly sound, and Professor Stoner has applied these principles in a proper and convincing way. Talking about the prophecy he did when he did a calculation on eight prophecy about Jesus Christ fulfilling upon the same person. This is from H. Harold Hartzler, Ph. the Secretary Treasurer to the American Scientific Association. A crazy smart guy. And he says, right, so Stoner says in his article that as we identify specific prophecies, we will, this is his statement, this is his statement, we will inquire what will be the statistical probability be that one man in how many men has fulfilled this prophecy. Right? A prophecy in one man called Jesus Christ. So eight prophecy, he took these eight prophecies, right, coming true. Micah 5, 2, Malachi 3, 1, Zechariah 9, 9, Zechariah 13, 6. Zechariah 11, 12, Zechariah 11, 13, Isaiah 53, 7, Psalm 22, 16. Eight of this. And he did the calculation of it happening in one man. This is 1 times m times n. It's 1 in 2.8 times 100,000 times 1,000 times 100 times 100, blah, blah, too many zeros. And this is the, the, the summary of what I just showed you. It's one, the probability of that is 1 in 2.8 times 10 to the 28th power. Right? Okay, power. But to be fair, you're going to calculate the total amount of humans that's ever lived on Earth. Because one among this whole population of this history of Earth can be that bad. So it has to be divided. It can be such a big number. There's been about 88 billion people who lived on Earth since the beginning of time until the time he wrote the article. 88 billion people total around the world, roughly. We don't have good sense, but roughly 88 billion. And he, took his, he calculated and it becomes 1 times 10 to the 28th power. This is the number. 1 in 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9 sets of 3 zeros. That's the probability. 8 billion divided 1 in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 100,000 5 sets of 0 is the final, final probability calculation of all 8 prophecies fulfilling in one man. That is equivalent, just to make it put it in perspective, that's equivalent of having a 50 cents coin up the state of Texas. 